Welcome to Management 301. Before we get to the introductions and overview of the course, let me tell you how I start this course when I teach it face to face. I would start with an exercise or activity that goes like this. I would ask the students in the classroom if they can point in the direction of north. Literally, show me which way the North Pole is. And the students are a little surprised. They don't know what's going on, but they start pointing in different directions. And every single time, there would be quite a few students who show or point in that direction, and then some students who point in that direction. There are always even some students who point upwards. And um, there is basically a mess going on in the classroom. And then I would say, let me refine the question. If you are sure you know which way north is, point in that direction. If you have any doubts, if you're not sure, do not participate in this activity. And at that point, about 20% of the class drops out, but most of them still keep participating and still keep pointing in different directions, like literally in different directions, in all possible 360 degrees. And then I would select two students who happen to point in the opposite directions. And I would say, look at yourself. You're about the same age, probably the same socioeconomic status. You go to the same school. You're probably equally smart. Yet you're pointing in the two opposite directions. Statistically speaking, it's impossible that both of you are right. It's possible that both of you are wrong, but it's impossible that both of you are right. So you have at the most 50-50 chance of being right. Are you sure you want to participate in this game again? So let's do it again. If you are absolutely sure you know which direction north is, and you are absolutely sure you are correct, and all those other people pointing in the wrong directions or different directions are wrong, participate. Otherwise, drop out. And even after this introduction, there would be about half of the students who are still participating and still, still pointing in different directions. And then I would say, look carefully around, because what you see now that's what we'll see a lot during this semester, during this course. You will see people who seem to be reasonable, who seem to be smart, who have the basic logics, and yet in the evidence, overwhelming evidence of them being wrong, they continue insisting on their point of view. So they continue insisting that what they think is right, the direction that they chose, is the correct one, even though half of the class, even maybe most of the people in the class, are pointing in the opposite direction. And then obviously, instead of just stopping there, I would take out the compass and I would actually show which way north is. But the point of this exercise is not to determine the direction of north, but to show that in some uh, issues or on some issues, on some topics, people may disagree, even if there is a very good chance or good evidence that they are wrong. They would cling to their original opinion and they would not listen to the alternative opinion. And that for sure happens a lot in an international business course. Uh, we will be talking about many controversial issues like uh, immigration, like uh, import tariffs, free trade, globalization, all those issues that divide us, uh, especially during the last uh, presidential campaign. And people come with their predetermined views in most cases, they haven't researched those topics. All they know about those topics is what they've heard from the presidential candidates, maybe read somewhere on the news, but they didn't really conduct the studies or didn't really read the scientific studies on the topic. So they have limited knowledge, but a very, very strong opinion. And so it's very important that if you took this course, that you're prepared to be challenged and you have an open mind because many things we will discuss may contradict your pre-existing views. So I hope you will not get upset too much when uh, the evidence to the contrary will be presented. And hopefully when strong evidence is presented contrary to your um, point of view, you will be smart enough, uh, open-minded enough to maybe adjust your views. Anyway, now let's do the introductions. So my name is Bas Taras. Uh, you can call me Vas, no need for the doctor or professor. If you would like to show me your respect, then uh, just do your homework on time and give me a little trouble. I have a huge class, it's a very, very large class, and I have a lot of students. And uh, every time something goes wrong, it takes a lot of time. And even if it goes wrong only for 5% of the class, it's like a whole working day gone. <clears throat> so if you would like to make me happy, 
try to stay on course, try to do your work on time, and try to uh, take as little as possible time, not only from me, but from the rest of the class. So as long as we are organized, I'm happy. No need for the formalities. Just to give you an idea who I am, uh, so as I said, my name is Bas Taras. Uh, I specialize in international business in general and uh, cross-cultural um, work groups, teams in particular. I got my PhD from the University of Calgary, which is in Canada, uh, in um, human resources and organizational dynamics with the international dimension to this, uh, international business strategy. So I basically study topics or study situations where people from different countries, cultures come together. Those sorts of situations or settings on the one hand present great opportunities, on the other hand present a number of challenges. And so I'm trying to study how we can minimize the challenges, the problems, and how we can maximize the opportunities, the potential of the multicultural teams. But obviously other topics related to international business are dear to my heart, and I studied them, and as I said, it's from trade to immigration to many other ones that we will discuss in this course. I did my master's and undergraduates in economics, and uh, in fact, at some point, I even taught statistics. So my bachelor's and my master's were very much in uh, number disciplines, so I was very much a quantitative guy. For my PhD, I still did a lot of quantitative uh, research, and uh, I took must have been a dozen classes in statistics and so on, so I'm kind of good with that, but I shifted my focus more from the numbers and technical aspects to people. Uh, I will talk later about why I did that, but I think I came to a realization that the soft side uh, is probably even more important than the hard side of, of business while recognizing again the importance of accounting, of finance, of economics. I've done that, I know that, I had very good grades in that, so it's not because I couldn't master the numbers and the more technical disciplines. Um, I'm a member of the Academy of Management, a member of the Academy of International Business. Um, I'm on the editorial board of half a dozen journals uh, in international business. In fact, some of the most, uh, in fact, some of the, the most prestigious, uh, prestigious journals in the field. Uh, kind of a big deal, I was recently inducted as a fellow of the Academy of International Business um, at the Southeast USA uh, chapter here, so it's a um, serious thing. So international business is what I do and uh, what I'm known for. Uh, I have dozens of publications, uh, including, for example, a book on experiential learning in international business education. So the good news for you is that um, the topic, the, the subject that I'm teaching here, I really know it well. I cannot say that I know all the answers, but I know most of the information, most of the research conducted by my colleagues over the decades that we've been studying these topics. The bad news is uh, that um, I will expect you to also learn a lot about it. So it will be a simple and enjoyable course, but it will not be a very easy ride. So I will expect you to go a little deeper than maybe some other instructors may expect you to do. And in terms of my personal international experience, I was uh, born in Ukraine. And uh, those of you who don't know where Ukraine is, here is the map. So it's uh, in Europe, Eastern Europe. I left uh, Ukraine at the age of 16 uh, to go and study as an exchange student in Germany, in, uh, in München, Munich. Uh, I was briefly back to Ukraine in my 20s, but then left for good um, to the United States, where I did, you know, first my master's in Texas, then I did my PhD in Canada, taught in Canada for a while, and then ended up here in the United States. Uh, I mean, in North Carolina. Uh, because of my work and my research, I've been uh, working, studying, visiting, presenting my work, lecturing in quite a few countries. In fact, here are some of the uh, locations where I've been for a little bit, bit more than just, you know, a few days. And uh, I guess that travel, that exposure to international situations, that's what drove my uh, interest in international business, and that's why I'm sitting here and teaching this course and not a different course. This is my family, if you would like to meet me at the personal level, my lovely wife and my two kids. The pictures are a little outdated, the kids are slightly older today, but still look very much the same. Uh, they're right here in Greensboro. Um, 
if it was a face-to-face -face class, I would very much want to meet you and I would ask you where you come from, what majors you represent, and unfortunately we cannot do that. So um, the biggest question I have for you is, are you from the United States or are you from somewhere else? I sure hope there are some students in this class who have international background. That helps a lot, especially in the discussions, which we probably will not be able to have a lot because of the online nature of this course. But if you happen to be from a different country, you let me know so I know what countries are represented. Maybe you will chime in and maybe you will contribute to some of the discussions. You can always pr provide examples from your um, own experience in other countries, be it by you know the virtue of being from a different country by origin, or maybe you just traveled or worked in a different country, so those are extremely welcome. In fact, if you give me good examples, good stories about other cultures, I may even give you a bonus point, um, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Now, about this course. Um, I have been teaching this course for eight years, so it's my ninth year here in Greensboro, and I've been teaching it from day one when I came here. Um, the good news here is that I've uh, figured out most of the course design features, I guess, and so I've polished it to the extent where it's now, my hope is, a smooth and um, nice ride. Uh, there are some courses that you take uh, that look like this. So where the path to A plus is very convoluted, it's very complicated, you never know what needs to be done. With Management 301, I've been trying my best uh, to design the course in a way that will make this path to your A plus as straight as possible. So something like this. Um, and it seems to be working that way. Students seem to report uh, low stress and high clarity as to what's expected, what they need to do, when and how to get the A plus. And in fact, many students do get A plus. I would probably have about 30% of the students getting A plus, minus A, uh, another maybe 30% in the B range and only a very small number of students who are below B. So as long as you try, you're pretty much guaranteed to get a good grade. However, and this is very important, um, when the path to your A plus is a straight road, it would be a simple path, but not necessarily an easy one. Uh, I regret to say it, in fact, I almost feel ashamed to say it, but in a course like this, your uh, smarts, your IQ, your maybe even creativity, unfortunately will not help you much. You can be extremely smart, but if you don't do the course readings, if you don't walk this straight and long path, you probably will not get an A+. Plus because the road that is straight doesn't have shortcuts, so you have to walk the path. You have to do all those whatever number of thousands of steps you need to reach that A+. Plus. As long as you walk it, you will get your A+. Plus. It's not statistics, it's not accounting, where sometimes some concepts are just so complicated that no matter how many times you read that textbook, you still don't get it. No, it's not like that. You read it once, you watch my video lecture, there is no way you will not understand it. There is no way you will not know the answer on the exam. But at the same time, and this is the bad news, if you don't read, if you don't watch the video lecture, you will not know the answer. In fact, let me do an illustration here. And again, if it was a face-to-face -face class, I would have done it with a real glass and real, you know, uh, pebbles. But uh, let me illustrate it how it goes in, a, in the electronic format. So in a class that I teach face-to-face, -face, I would do an exercise that goes like this. I would uh, show a glass to the classroom and I would ask them if the glass is full. And pretty much all of the students would say the glass is empty. There are always a few who are kind of smart and they would say, oh, no, it's not empty. There is air in it. But no, as I said, this class, the design of this class is simple. You don't have to get smart. You just have to be straightforward and hardworking, right? And so we look at the glass and clearly it is empty. No tricks, no games. It's an empty glass. And then I would put in this glass rocks, some rocks. And I would say, is the, the, the glass full now? And the class would say, yeah, it seems to be full now. Yeah, it seems like it's, you know, filled up with the rocks. But then I would pull out like little pebbles, like gravel, and I would put that gravel in the glass and I would say, well, but it seems like we have room for more. Uh, is the glass full now? And the students say, oh, okay, well, yeah, now it seems full though. Some students start, you know, doubting as to what's, what's going on here. And then I would take a bottle of beer and I would pour that beer in the glass and I would say, is it full now? 
Students say, yeah, now probably it is full, but then again, some of them have doubts. The point of this exercise is the following. In this course, we will be talking about different issues, or we will be talking about some issues at a different level. And so some of them will be fundamental issues, fundamental concepts. And those are those big rocks. So, for example, we will be talking about immigration, we will be talking about exchange rates, we will be talking about import tariffs. You all know what those are. You all have probably met people who are immigrants, or maybe you are an immigrant yourself. So you know the definition, you know the concept. You all probably have, at some point, bought um, foreign currencies. So you know how they work, you know what the exchange rates are. Uh, same thing with import tariffs. You hear about them, you know what they are. And that's good. It's a, you know, you need those big fundamental rocks, the foundation for this course. You need to know it. But the bad news is, if that's all you know, you will get an F for this course. There will be no single question on any of the exams that will require you to answer simple fundamental questions like that. If it's something that everybody on the street, you ask 10 random people and none of them will know the answer, we will not test that on the exam. You will be expected to know it. But that's for everybody. We will go a little deeper. So the content of this course that we will learn and that we will test will be those small gravel pieces. This is something that most people don't know. So for example, when we talk about immigration, you will have to learn or understand or know the pros and cons, the economic consequences, both positive and negative. And not just some of them, like, oh, they steal our jobs or, oh, uh, they provide cheap labor. No, it will have to be a much more deeper understanding of the phenomenon. At least 10 possible effects on the economy from the positive point of view, from the negative point of view, and then an explanation of how exactly, for example, they can improve or uh, hurt unemployment rate. So you will have to know much more than an average person knows on the street. And yes, that beer over there that you see, that's uh, for graduate school. No matter how many little pebbles you put there, there is always room for... Um, learning some more. And uh, if you will find this topic interesting, which I hope you will, and if you will want to study it some more, graduate school is where you would go with that. So that's for grad school stuff. All right, the most important features of this course uh, are the following. So one, this is very important. When you email me, when you communicate with me, try to put, put Management 301 in the subject line. And there are several reasons for that. Seems like it's irrelevant, but it's actually very important. One, uh, I deal with a huge, huge volume of emails. As I will talk later, I lead this X Culture International Collaboration Project. And there are over 4,000 participants in that project every semester, including you, by the way. And as you can imagine, at least, I don't know, 5% of the people email me daily. So we're talking about hundreds of emails. And you are obviously the most important um, stakeholders or most important clients, constituencies, I don't know, customers for me. And I would like to give your emails a priority. But if I don't see right away that that's from one of my own students, I will not know that that's the top priority. And I may not be able to get to your email until I get to it in the normal order, which could be, you know, hours later. Usually it would be the same day, but it would be hours later. So by putting Management 301 in the subject line, it will allow me to identify you as a more important message and reply to you faster. Second, and this is very important, uh, I end a semester with literally tens of thousands of emails in my uh, deleted uh, and uh, sent drop boxes. And my email account is not unlimited. So once you put a few thousand um, emails there, it's almost full. And so it's very important for me at the end of the semester to be able to identify the messages that are no longer needed, no longer relevant. And so I need to have a keyword to know that. So management 301 in the subject line. Prerequisites, there are no prerequisites for this course, but there is an international economics course also taught at this school or at other schools if you talk, took it there. And there is some overlap between these two courses. So if you've taken international economics, you may see some of the topics to be similar, especially when it comes to trade. The difference here is that in economics, they primarily talk about the models of international trade. They primarily talk about things that um, um, a more for policy development. Whereas in management uh, 301, in international business courses, we primarily talk uh, about it from the managerial point of view. So if you were to lead a company, uh, manage a company, 
uh, what you need to know as a manager about international trade, about policies, not as a uh, decision maker, but more as a manager. Though we will talk about decision making as well, maybe with fewer numbers than in a traditional economics course. Uh, for the textbooks, um, we use the textbook by Wild Wild, uh, so it's two authors with the same last name, uh, called International Business. The latest textbook at this time is edition, or the latest edition is now edition 8. And it would be wonderful if you got that one. But it's quite pricey. It's about $130 if you want to buy it. And uh, the thing is, and I guess the publishers will not like me for that, but uh, the truth is that it hasn't changed much from edition to edition over the last several uh, editions. So if you would like to save money, feel free to buy the 7th edition or even the 6th edition, or even the 5th edition. So the 5th edition you can probably get like for $5 online, and it will have exactly the same list of chapters, exactly the same list of concepts and theories. The only difference, and that's kind of big, but you know, not super important, are the statistics. So each edition has the newer statistics, like GDP per capita per country, or whatever numbers we provide. As well as um, it has newer case studies, newer examples. When I started teaching this course eight years ago, that was right at the time when Obama was elected the president and right before his inauguration. And then over that time, the world has changed a lot. So before then, uh, the economy was booming and prospering. 2008, the economic crash. Uh, 2009, uh, crash, I mean, the economic uh, crashed. 2009, uh, big, big trouble, you know, one of the uh, most difficult years slow recovery, and then we had uh, one presidential campaign, another presidential campaign, all the changes in Europe, now Trump has been elected the president. So uh, many, many things are changing in the world, and so some of the cases that the older editions provide may by now be uh, irrelevant. And so if you want to get the latest examples, get the latest textbook. At the same time, I'd like to say that we will be relying on the textbook, but not as much in, as in some other courses. So uh, there will be... Um, many additional examples, many additional theories, concepts that I will cover in this course that the textbook doesn't cover. And uh, at the same time, everything you need to know will be covered in the video lectures. So um, the textbook is not as important, and if you want to save money, feel free to get an older copy. Uh, though again, I encourage you to get the latest one if you can, if you can afford it. Another thing that I offer, especially if you're right here in Greensboro, and I know some students are taking this course from overseas or from other states, um, I, I don't know if the publishers, you know, are happy about that, but I don't mind. Uh, I created this uh, online resource, a page, where students who took my course last semester can sell their textbooks to the students who take my course this semester. And so this way we can recycle some of those textbooks. In fact, when this semester is over, if you want to sell your textbook, you can list it on that same website and then sell it to my future students. I will be teaching it again next semester and then semester after that. So no need to go through the bookstore or online stores. You can get your money back by selling it to my students. There are also a number of recommended readings, so some uh, fun additional books that I recommend that you read. Those are not required, but if you are interested in international business, I hope you will find this topic interesting. Uh, those are some of the books listed in the syllabus in the recommended readings options. Um, I will also have some uh, short readings assigned for each of the lectures. Again, some optional, some required, but those will be posted for you on, the, um, on Canvas uh, so you can download them and read them there. And yes, uh, at UNCG we use Canvas for com communication. One quick uh, note on that. Uh, to avoid confusion with the Canvas course sections, I uh, put all the documents in files section. So there is no separate section for syllabus or something. Everything is in, in the files sections section, uh, including the syllabus, including the slides, including the optional readings. So everything you need is already there. The only thing that is not on Canvas are the video lectures. And the reason for that is that Canvas gives me only one gigabyte um, of space uh, for a course. And the video lectures in good quality are over a gigabyte each lecture. So uh, therefore I post them on YouTube and you can just watch them on YouTube, which also works a little better than the uh, files that you can download of, uh, for example, um, Canvas, because first you will not have problems with the 
file format so you can uh, watch YouTube on any device phone uh, computer um, a tablet also you can always download them off YouTube so just you know type um, YouTube downloader and you will have lots of links and you just put the um, uh, uh, the shared link the video link and download it and you can then you know watch it all offline if you want so it works well for everyone I will not talk much about the course objectives. You can read them in the course overview. Uh, we will talk about basically all of the topics related to international business. And um, one of the features here is, or one of the interesting things about this course is that we will kind of move over all the major disciplines of management or business, but we'll talk about them from the international perspective. So we will have a lecture on, for example, marketing. But instead of talking about marketing as you would talk about it in a marketing course, we will say, all right, so you know the basics of marketing. Now let's discuss how those things may or may not work in international context. Why, for example, some of the things need to be adjusted to this international you know, uh, context. Same thing with HR. You all probably have taken HR at some point and you know what recruitment and selection is and compensation and all those HR topics. And we'll talk about them from the perspective of international business. We will talk about them from the perspective, all right, why, for example, this compensation system may not work in this culture, or, or why, for example, the recruitment tools that work well in your country may not and probably will not work in, for example, China or whatever other country we have. And so we'll talk about finance, we'll talk about, as I said, just about any discipline that falls within the business category, but we'll talk about it uh, how it is different, how it has to be adjusted in the international context. Now, this is an online course, and so there will be several ways in which we will communicate. So, me communicating with you will be primarily through video lectures and emails. So, uh, for every topic that we cover in this class, there is a video lecture. And it's about standard length. It's uh, one hour up to 30 minutes, one, one hour, 30 minutes. Some topics are bigger, so there will be lectures, you know, that are three hours, so, you know, two lectures basically in one. Um, I've been thinking for a long time about splitting those video lectures into short segments or modules, you know, like five to ten minutes each. But I haven't done it. And the reason for that is this. Um, when you watch it on YouTube, if you pause and close the video, when you come back to that link, it will automatically take you to where you stopped. And so I figured if I had, uh, instead of one lecture that is one hour, let's say, 30 minutes, if I had 15 sections of eight minutes, it would be just difficult for, you know, uh, open, close, open, close, forget which one you've done. Uh, so it seems like it wouldn't serve any purpose other than, you know, knowing that your attention span is limited. Uh, I suppose it would have been, you know, maybe serving you a little bit better if it was shorter. But what I encourage you to do is, you know, literally just listen maybe five, ten minutes at a time. Uh, just, you know, watch or listen. And then when you get tired, uh, if you feel like you're not understanding it anymore, just stop. And then when you're ready again, go, again, uh, go ahead again. Um, the video lectures will be designed in a way that um, allows you to listen. There will be sometimes graphs and charts and numbers that would be helpful to see but at the same time, if you don't want to see the video, it's fine. It's going to be me just talking primarily. So you can just listen. And the beauty of that is this. You will not have to spend any time on basically, you know, listening to the video lectures. And when I say you will not have to spend any time, it doesn't mean that you will not have to do it. It, it means that you will be able to do it while you do something else. For example, if it takes you some time to get to work or to school, biking, bus, car, whatever, uh, walking maybe, you can do the video lectures while you commute. Uh, if you go to the gym and you work out, just pop the ear uh, phones in your ears and just listen. If you work in the, you know, uh, cleaning your house or working in the garden, you can totally do the lectures during that time. And so this way you don't have to waste your time on just the video lectures. You can always do that while you do something else. The only problem with that is that you probably want to do some, you know, take notes or maybe, you know, um, highlight some things. And so if you want to do that, and I encourage you to do that, you probably want to have the, you know, the file open and, uh, you know, leave some comments or maybe on a piece of paper. 
but again that, that that is not necessary and you can totally just rely on the sound and not need to see the video in fact most of the YouTube downloaders allow you to choose if you download it as audio only or as audio and video and so if you want to download it only as an mp3 uh, a file you don't even have to you know to have the picture on the screen and you can just listen I would still recommend that you get the video because as I said sometimes there will be a, a uh, charts and graphs and pictures that you need to see and uh, unfortunately the sound will not describe it enough so it would be nice if you were able to look up uh, on the video from time to time so that you know you know what's going on but it's not necessary if you drive that's perfectly fine and then I will also be sending you emails uh, so obviously there will be announcements going out through the email uh, the grades will be on Canvas, but I will also send you your personal performance reviews via email from time to time so you know how you're doing you talking to me, email is the best way by far, and I will try to respond quickly, uh, usually within the same day. Uh, but if you need to talk more, feel free to call me. Call me or Skype me if you want, um, and we will talk. You're most welcome to stop by my office and talk to me if you happen to be in Greensboro. Uh, just I'm not sure if I will be always available. I do have my office hours, and I will definitely be available during that time. But if you need to talk to me in person, just stop by wherever. Uh, I'm around, around most of the time, uh, and we'll talk. Sometimes, by the way, a phone call is much more effective than an email. So if you just, you know, something more complicated, call me. Five minutes, and we are done, rather than, you know, waiting until I read the message and then me typing up the answer. All right? So, uh, PowerPoints. We will be using PowerPoints, and uh, they're already all posted on Canvas. Uh, one important note about PowerPoints is that I deliberately designed them to be wordy. They have a lot of text, sometimes full sentences, and many people wonder, oh, he must be not very smart. Don't you know the basics of effective presentations? Put one picture, maybe one word. Don't put many words. Have you seen the presentations by Steve Jobs when he presented the iPhone or um, iPad? It's all emotional, all, you know, just picture and no words. And the answer is yes, I know that. You know, if I were trying to sell you something or convince you of something, that's what I would, uh, I would do. I would not put any words. I would just put pictures and I would communicate with you at the emotional level. The reason I designed the video lectures to be wordy, to have a lot of text, is because I want them to serve more as the class notes rather than the slides. You don't really need to see what's on the slides when you're listening to me. Maybe if you do, I'll actually have just the picture. But in most cases, I want you to use those slides as my basically abbreviated textbook chapter or class notes. I want you to be able to use them before the exam to quickly review the material. I want you to be able to understand the, the concepts covered in the lecture by simply looking at the slides. If I used the slides that are normal, you know, uh, just a picture or a graph and no text, they are good to kind of buttress my points while I'm talking, but they're completely useless on their own. You cannot understand what's going on there. You can maybe see the names of the topics or maybe some of the, you know, pictures. But you cannot use those slides to review the material. You cannot not use those slides to um, um, prepare yourself for the exam. Whereas my detailed slides literally can be read as a as a class notes, as you know, a short version of the chapter. And so uh, I've heard many good things about them, especially as I said, when students prepare for the exams. In fact, because it's an online course. The exams are basically open books, open notes. There is no way I can police, I can ensure that you're not using books. Therefore, I assume you do. And so when you will be taking the test, in many cases, it's much, much more effective to use the slides printed out or maybe on the um, second screen uh, to answer the questions because the textbook has many pages and it takes a long time to find what you're looking for. With the slides, it's only what you need in a condensed form yet detailed enough so you can understand right away what's going on. So I designed them that way specifically. Now, should you listen to the video lectures? Should you watch the video lectures? This is very important, extremely important. In fact, let me pause here so that you understand how important that is. All right, I hope I got your attention. Yes, video lectures are important. There are several reasons for that. One, in video lectures, 
I focus on the materials that will be tested on the exam. If you watch video lectures, there is no way you will not be prepared for the exam. If you watch them carefully, if you watch them thoughtfully, maybe taking notes, I guarantee you, you will know answers to every single question on the exam. You will be guaranteed A+. plus. It's simple material and video lectures are tailored to the exams. So there will be nothing on the exam that is not covered in the video lecture and uh, the video lectures will not contain much other stuff that is not covered on the exam. The textbook are not quite like that. So they tend to be drier. They tend to have more noise. They tend to have all those case studies that sometimes are, it's not that they are relevant, but we will not test them. So there will be much stuff in the textbook that is not directly relevant to what you're tested on. And at the same time, the textbook is not going to contain everything you need for the test. The textbook are old, outdated. I mean, it's been written years ago. By the time it's published, it's, it's, it's not that it's outdated, but it doesn't contain some of the most important stuff. Second, uh, there are some things I know about the topic that the authors of the textbook do don't know, and I felt obliged to include it so to make sure that you are properly educated, so that you don't only know some of the basics, but you actually know international business. And so by simply reading the textbook, you probably will not prepare yourself sufficiently for the exam. It will have all the definitions, it will have all the theories, so you should be okay with the textbook only. But my experience of you know teaching this course for eight years, uh, one or two sections every semester plus, plus summer, so I've done it like 25 times now, um, is that if you rely on the textbook only, you will probably not get an A+. Plus. Just because, as I said, it presents the material in a much less memorable way, if you want to put it that way, and uh, as I said, less focused way and more dry way, and so it's much more difficult to study the subject by simply reading the text than by communicating with me, even if it's, you know, through a video lecture. Second, and this is very important, in the video lectures, I include uh, usually five questions that will appear on the exam, or very similar to those that will appear on the, on the exam, though most of them are actually on the exam. And so every 10 minutes or so, there will be a question. It looks exactly like a real exam question, and in many cases, it is a real exam question. And so I do that to kind of wake you up, and also to make sure that you, um, you know, understand what I've been talking about the last 10 minutes. But most important, it also to give you an opportunity to test yourself, to test whether you've understood the material enough. If you can answer a question that will appear on the exam, on the past 10-15 minutes of the lecture. And so those questions will not be posted anywhere else, so you can only get them if you watch the video lecture, and um, so you would basically you know, get that bonus. So if you watch every video lecture, you will probably know or have seen uh, at least half of the exam questions, like literally half of all the exam questions. So not only you will know the material better, but you will literally have previewed and saw the answers to most or a good half of the exam questions. And so that's the best way to prepare for the exam. And again, for me, it's to, to kind of provide you a self-testing opportunity, but also to give you an additional incentive to watch the video lectures. Uh, as I said, it's, it's, you will be much better off. You will save time and improve your grade by watching the video lectures. It may seem like, oh, it's so long, so slow, uh, maybe I should just read the book and it will take me less time. The reality is not necessarily. Yes, you can cover the topic through the textbook and probably have the time, but chances are you'll get about 25% of the knowledge. So and then you will have to read it again before the exam and maybe again and again and again. I think in the long run you will save time by watching video lectures and maybe quickly then reviewing the textbook than not doing so. But anyway, your choice, I recommend it, I highly recommend it, but if you don't watch the video lectures, uh, don't be surprised if your exam performance will be not as high as you may think it should be. Um, it's been the case, and unfortunately that's what it is. At the same time, uh, those who watch the video lectures, you will be surprised how well you will do it on the exam. As I said, this is simple stuff. As long as you watch it, as long as you communicate with me online, uh, you, will, you will know the answers. The grade, standard letter grade scale, so in terms of the components of the grade, so there will be three exams, and uh, each of them would have been 25%, but I uh, assigned only 20% to the first exam, just because it's first, just because, you know, you're not sure what's going on, what to expect. So I don't want it to weight it so heavily 
and I wanted to give you an opportunity to, you know, if there is an error, if your grade is lower, it will not affect your subsequent grades. So I reduced the first exam's weight to 20%, and then 25 and 25 for the second and the third exam. The exams are non-cumulative, so once you're done with exam one, <laughs> it's not that you can forget that material, but you will not need it directly for the second and the third exam. Then, and this is very important, we will have the X culture project. Wonderful, wonderful thing. It probably is uh, the best thing that will happen to you in academia. And the reason I say that is not because, you know, I'm narcissistic or, you know, I uh, love what I do. Uh, we have over 4,000 participants in this project every semester over 120 universities, over 40 countries, including my own students, up to 200 of them. And obviously, uh, we uh, test rigorously whether or not this project has an impact on students, not only knowledge and behaviors and skills, but also satisfaction. And so, in fact, we published a study not so long ago that looked at different levels of course effectiveness. And we found that uh, students who have ex-culture compared to other course sections, including my own, that for testing purposes had a different project, you know, a domestic project. So those who have Exculture report greater satisfaction with the course. Funny enough, uh, they not only give higher course evaluations in general, but also on every single dimension, including them, like for example, organization of the course. And when you have Exculture, it's a little more hectic. It's a little more, it's not really it's disorganized, it's more <clears throat> Um, complicated and technically on that dimension I should be getting lower evaluations but it seems like due to the halo effect people like the course in general so they even give me better evaluations on the dimensions where maybe you know that grade should have gone down and I appreciate that by the way but then we also tested whether you do uh, better on let's say cultural intelligence test and yes you do not only better than the control group but also better from before to after so the cultural intelligence improves your attitudes improve you become more interested in international collaboration in a career in international business interestingly and that is something I cannot explain you even do better on the exams compared to the control group that had a, an alternative project domestic project those course sections that had Exculture did better on the exam. I don't know, it's motivation, or maybe you learned something. Who knows? But you did better on the exam. And then uh, I'm not even going to uh, you know, count how many emails. I mean, literally, we're talking dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, every single semester that I get from my students who just took the course and some of those from those who took the course years ago who say that, thank you so much for this project. Uh, it allowed me to get a better job. The certificate that I got allowed me, uh, you know, to get a job that I wanted. Uh, and now that I'm doing international business, every day I see things that you taught or I learned through Exculture. Plus, uh, you will be working with people from all around the world, and so that's a great opportunity to, you know, find friends in other countries, expand your professional and personal networks. So, a very interesting project. And I have a separate video, a relatively short video, that specifically tells you what Exculture is. How to expect, I mean, what to expect, and how to succeed in it. Uh, so, I'm not going to go into the details here. I'll just tell you that the main idea of this project is that you will complete a uh, consulting project for a real international business company while working in a team that is comprised, composed of people from different countries. So, uh, we have about 4,000 participants in the project every semester. And we put them in global virtual teams of about uh, seven or six. Every person is from a different location. There may be two students from the United States just because it's a big, diverse country. And everybody else from, will be from a different country. And so you will have team members literally on every continent. And so there are two main purposes for this project. On the one hand, you will have to complete a project in a team of um, you know, people from different countries. You will have to deal with the time zone differences. You will have to deal with the cultural differences, institutional differences. So it's a very important experience for you. So you will sometimes be challenged, sometimes uh, will experience problems, but that is good because that's what we want you to experience to preview so that in the future when you have to do it for real as part of your job, you know what to expect and know how to resolve those problems. Second, um, in the early stages of the project, we would uh, ask you to write you know, a hypothetical case study. Now we have real companies 
presenting real life international business challenges. And because of that, there will be real CEOs, there will be real company owners, you will meet them face to face, we will have webinars, live webinars, and you will discuss issues with them, you know, ask about their company, uh, provide your ideas, they will provide feedback. So you will actually meet those people. In fact, after the project is over, the best students will be invited to the Exculture Symposium. And you will literally meet your team members, you will meet the, uh, the clients, and you will learn more about international business. So you will have both the experience of international collaboration, but also the experience of basically consulting, problem solving for businesses. And we will give you a very detailed reference letter at the end and a certificate that signifies your ability to work in uh, international teams and resolve complex problems for businesses. And those are big deals. It's not going to be only just a grade. You will actually get something that will help you launch a successful career in international business. But as I said, uh, there is enough information about that in that separate video. Plus, um, I will be sending you the course materials, the project materials, closer to its start. So uh, no worries. We will deal with that a little later. And then obviously there are num a number of opportunities to earn bonuses. So uh, theoretically, you can get for this course more than 100 points total. So um, there will be several opportunities or different opportunities to earn bonus points. One, for every lecture, there is a um, bonus assignment. Uh, it will be comprised of two components. One in the syllabus. In fact, if you look here at the picture, at the end of the syllabus, when we have the list of the topics, you will see a set of green questions for each of the lecture. And so for the bonus assignment, what you'll need to do is to read those questions and provide answers. Uh, the answers do not have to be very detailed. They do not have to be perfect. They have to be more your initial responses, perhaps, and maybe some of the thoughts that you have after watching the video lecture. So it's more about the effort rather than the, uh, the knowledge. So if you give some thought to that, if you uh, tell me that you, uh, you know, basically show me that you've thought about those issues, and maybe, you know, borrowed some of the ideas from the lectures, I will give you full credit. Like, for example, first lecture will be on economic systems, and the questions would be, what are the pros and cons of the free market economy, and then the command economy? Again, if you give, give it some thought and, you know, like, give me a few examples or ideas why free market economy may be good, or why the free market economy may be bad, that's all I want. You do it, you're guaranteed, uh, you're guaranteed to get your bonus points. And then those questions that you will see in the lectures will appear in that test. Again, you will have to know those answers. And uh, it's, as I said, a way for me to test whether or not you watch the lectures uh, and for you to a way to test your knowledge. Again, very easy. You're pretty much guaranteed to know the answers if you watch the lecture. And you do that, you are guaranteed point to points uh, per one uh, bonus assignment. And since we have 23 lectures uh, and point to points per one, that will basically give you, if you do every one of them, and I encourage you to do every one of them, you will get four and a half, four point six points extra added to your total grade, which could be a difference between B plus and A minus. In fact, it could be a difference between B plus and A. So I encourage you to do it, but uh, there is a catch, there is a trick. Uh, the bonus assignments are all now posted on Canvas, and you can do them anytime. In fact, you can sit down now and do them all for the rest of the semester. You probably won't be able to do it just because it's many of them and because you do need to review the materials before you provide the answers. But if you want to do that, you can do that. At the same time, they will disappear at the time on the day when the video lecture is due or the suggested time when you should watch the video lecture. So the catch here is that you need to do them on schedule. And that's my way to not only prompt you to watch the video lectures, but do it regularly. Too many students wait until the last day and then before the exam they're trying to catch up on the material and watch all six, seven video lectures and do all the bonus assignments. And that's bad. It will not work. The problem with that is, as I said, it's a lot of material. It's not something you can quickly review. Video lectures are one to one and a half hours, and if you have six or seven of them, actually more than that, it's more like ten of them uh, for each exam, right? Or, or eight of them, I believe. So that's like eight hours, ten hours of lectures. I mean, there is no way you can watch lectures for the whole day. It's important that you do it a little at a time, like two of them every week. And so the, the bonuses will expire as per the syllabus schedule. 
uh, the schedule presented in the syllabus. So you have to do it on time. You have to do it a little bit every week to get those bonus points. I will not allow you to submit them retroactively. As I said, these are not quizzes. These are not homework, homework assignments. These are bonuses. And so that's a way for me to stimulate you, to prompt you to do the materials, readings, video lectures on time, not wait until the last of the day. And the last one, or another opportunity to earn bonus points, is um, to help improve this course. I've been teaching it for a long time. But every semester I update the course. I add you know, new materials, new wording, new examples, new video lectures, uh, and uh, I make mistakes sometimes. Uh, I may make typos, I may uh, use poor language. Um, English is not my first language, English is not my second language, English is not my third language, English is my fourth language. Obviously I will be making errors. Uh, even native speakers occasionally make errors, right? So if you are watching the video lectures, when you are reading the materials, the syllabus, if you see any problems, if you see any way to improve the scores, correct the typo, uh, suggest better wording, maybe provide a better picture, maybe any formatting issues, anything else you see, maybe even an email I send out that contains an error, not a typo because I will not be able to resend the email, but maybe there is some sort of you know incorrect statement in that email, something that may confuse the students. Let me know. As long as you take the time to point out my errors to me, my mistakes to me, I will not only correct them right away, but I will give you a bonus because it's better to you know be uh, I don't want to call the word embarrassed. I'm not going to be embarrassed, but it's better to you know deal it with one student, you know student, work it out and fix it for the rest of the class than you know keep that problem there and everybody be not happy about it. In fact, even when you watch my video lectures, if you hear that I mispronounce some words due to my accent, correct me. I will greatly appreciate that because, you know, I can spend here decades and if nobody tells me that I'm pronouncing some words incorrectly, I may literally, you know, not know that I'm doing it wrong. Uh, so there are a number of words that students corrected me. In fact, I'll give you a few examples. And I'm so appreciative of those students taking their time and not being intimidated, you know, to correct their professor, because if they haven't, I would still be saying, for example, the word that is spelled F-O-C-U-C-U-S, uh, uh, right? I know now that the word is pronounced focus, right? Focus. Now I know it. But as many internationals, for many years, I used to say focus. And obviously that didn't sound right until one student told me about that. Or, for example, the word spelled S-H-E-E-T. So I used to say it shit, right? You know, that's the nature of, you know, my accent. Now I'm trying to say sheet, right? And even then it sounds a little funny. But at least, you know, somebody corrected me and now I know. But there was another word that students corrected um, uh, when I was teaching statistics. Uh, so the slope, you know, like a slope of the line, I used to say it's slop. And we know that slop is something else, right? So it's garbage. And so, uh, again, if it was not for the students, I probably would still say it the same old way. So if you correct me, I will appreciate that a lot, and I will even give you a bonus. Anyway, in the syllabus, you have the, sec uh, the schedule. And uh, so as long as you follow the schedule, you will be fine. And as I said, there is a video lecture for each of the topics, and you just click on this link, and it will take you to the video lecture. And if you would like to download it, just download it off YouTube and watch them. And if you want to earn some extra points, uh, do the green questions, do those little assignments uh, that are posted on Canvas. And if you want to learn even more, for each of the lectures I have a few optional readings assigned. And if it's a short article, it's right there in Canvas in the Files to Us folder already split by the section, just download it and read it. And if it's a book, uh, usually I cannot post the whole book, so you will have to uh, buy it if you want to read more about that. All right, that's pretty much all I wanted to say. Um, good luck, and I hope you will like this course. Stay in touch. Looking very much forward to another semester.